สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today we're going to be discussing the three poisons, specifically what they are, how they affect us in our daily life, and the antidote to these poisons, so that we can resolve these and eliminate them from the mind. Because on this path to enlightenment, it's very important that you pay special close attention to these three poisons and work to eliminate them. Because one who's attained enlightenment will have eliminated all three of these poisons 100%. So today we're going to be discussing this in detail and giving you a chance to ask questions and get clarifications on any of the teachings that we share today. As we do that, I would just like to remind everyone in the virtual classroom and anybody who's watching over social media that you can put into the chat window a question that you might have, and we have a moderator who is actually going to be able to ask your question and ensure you get the answer. For those of you that have joined us in the virtual classroom, you have an extra function where you can actually press to raise your hand and ask your question verbally if you like. Or ask any follow-up questions that you like. So as we get started, feel free to think about any questions that you might have based on things that you've potentially previously learned, or things that we're talking about today with the three poisons, because the three poisons really are so vitally important to understand as we get started here and understanding this path to enlightenment. We're in our Group learning program where we're learning chapter eight, which is transforming the three poisons: greed, hatred, and delusion. Let me just share with you guys what those three poisons are in more detail before we actually start talking about the remedy or the antidote. Here you can see that most people speak of the three poisons as greed, hatred, and delusion. You might also hear craving, anger, and ignorance. The reason why is because ways to kind of explain this, right? There's nothing that's really permanent. There's multiple ways of speaking of this. And what I would like to share with you is kind of an overview of the three poisons, and then depending on where your questions are, we can actually dive deeper into the three poisons. Essentially, greed, this first poison or this first poison of craving, is the central problem that Gautama Buddha discovered about the mind. This is where we see him talking in the Four Noble Truths about craving or desire or attachment, how the mind tends to hold on and latch on, and because of that, that that mental longing, that strong eagerness that the mind has. We call our own discontentness. It's because we crave permanence. The mind craves permanence until we train it otherwise. It tends to hold on, and it wants things to be pleasing. And because of this, we we cause our own discontent mind. And it's not until we train the mind to let go. And accept impermanence and recognize impermanence that the mind can be peaceful. Calm, serene, and content with joy, through eliminating all the mind's craving or desire or attachment, we essentially eliminate this first poison. But we haven't totally taken care of the problem, even though in the Four Noble Truths, this is the central teaching of the Buddha. The central teaching is that we cause our own discontent mind because of this mental longing, because of this craving for permanence. Because of this strong eagerness for things to be our way, but let's take this understanding of craving or greed and deepen it even further. So, causing the discontent mind, but it's causing a lot of un other unskillful and unbeneficial behaviors in your life. It not it's not just causing discontentness, but it's causing you to make other decisions that are causing. Problems in your life as well. Essentially, what this poison of greed or craving is doing is it's this burning desire, this unquenchable thirst for craving of objects, of things of our desire, that is a kind of longing for satisfaction to be fulfilled, 
in an outward direction, seeking fulfillment, seeking happiness, seeking pleasures outside externally. And because of the mind's external seeking for pleasures and for satisfaction, the mind is actually becomes discontent because the mind might latch on to a certain thing, a certain object, a certain material possession, a certain relationship, a certain situation or circumstance. And because of that, the mind is just craving and craving and craving and it wants that certain object of our desire. And if we get that object, we feel that we're happy. We feel content. We feel somewhat peaceful. We seem fulfilled. But then that external object or that relationship or that circumstance or that job or that income or that house, that car, that boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is, we eventually acquire that potentially. If we don't acquire it, then the mind's going to be discontent. It's going to experience sadness, anger, frustration, all these other discontent emotions. So if we don't get the object of our desire, if we don't fulfill our craving, the mind will be discontent. But if we do fulfill it, it will potentially be happy. It will potentially be fulfilled. But it's temporary because the object or the relationship or whatever that is, that external thing, it's impermanent. It's, it's not permanent. It's temporary. And that fulfillment that we feel, that happiness that we feel, it's completely temporary. It doesn't, it doesn't have any lasting fulfillment. So then the mind might crave and crave and crave and it gets that particular object and it feels satisfied for a week or a few weeks or a few months however long, but eventually the mind wants this less and less and less, and then there's a new craving that comes up. And now we have this new longing, this new eagerness, this new strong eagerness for something else. And now the mind becomes discontent because we don't have that. So we yearn for it and we crave it, and we work to, to get it. And then we work and work and work and we claw our way to get to that new object. And then eventually we, we don't have that either. Or eventually we acquire it where we don't. And then the mind becomes discontent if we don't acquire it. Or if we acquire it, then that eventually wears off. So let me give you an example. When we were children, we might have craved a bicycle really, really bad. And we wanted that bicycle. And we did everything we could to convince our parents to just get us that bicycle because we knew if we could just get that bicycle, we could play with our friends in the, in the village or in the neighborhood. We could go different places. We could just have so much fun with that bicycle. We needed that bicycle so badly. And we thought about it on when we went to sleep, we thought about it. When we woke up, we thought about it. During the day, we saw our friends riding bicycles and we just yearned for this bicycle. Well, eventually, our parents potentially was able to buy us that bicycle or maybe not. And we were just discontent. But if we were able to acquire that bicycle, it satisfied our desire for a period of time. And then eventually, as we played with that bicycle more and more and more, our desire, our happiness, our fulfillment of having that bicycle started to, to wane. It started to dissipate. Maybe the bike got a little bit older. Maybe we got bigger. Maybe somebody else got a better bicycle than ours and the ego's involved. And now we want a better bicycle than them. But eventually this bicycle didn't fulfill our craving anymore. And we decided we maybe wanted a motorcycle or we wanted a car or a skateboard or something else. And our mind latches onto that and it craves that. And then now we yearn and have this longing, this eagerness for this new object of our desire. Now we get that. We get the skateboard or the car or whatever it is. And now we're not happy with that because that starts to wear off. And now we want the BMW. And now the Toyota isn't good enough for us. We want the BMW. 
and then we get that and then that's not good enough we want the lamborghini and our mind just keeps craving 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 more and more and even if the toyota fulfills us for a period of time then the mind says well now i want a boyfriend or a girlfriend or now i want those new clothes or now i want those new shoes or i want that new house or I want that new job, or I want that new income, or I want that new set of he- earphones, or I want that new iPhone. And the mind just keeps having these wants and wants and wants. And they might not come so rapidly like I'm describing here, but over a period of time, the mind just keeps setting this higher and higher bar for itself of what it wants in order to be satisfied. And every time we acquire whatever that is that makes us feel satisfied, that is temporary because it's external. It never has lasting fulfillment because it's impermanent. And the real, the real contentness, the real peacefulness is actually in the mind of not wanting all of this stuff, not having this longing, this strong eagerness, but instead just pursuing our needs and what we need in life. So this poison of craving, it causes all kinds of complications in our life. Not only does it cause discontentness, it it causes us to, to work and work and work and work and long and long and long and just keep this cycle of just longing and longing and longing this cycle just continues and it never ends because we're always looking for the next thing that's going to satisfy the mind and it's craving that is the fuel for the cycle of rebirth so if the mind is having this craving over and over and over and over again It's going to keep latching on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And if you get to the end of your life and you haven't extinguished this craving in order to attain enlightenment, then mind's just going to keep craving and there's going to be rebirth because there's still craving in the mind. So not only does craving cause discontentness, not only does craving cause you to work and you're just constantly pursuing all these endless cravings, not only does it create rebirth and cause you to be reborn back in the world, but it's sabotaging your relationships. It's sabotaging, sabotaging your ability to just exist peacefully around others because the mind is always craving something rather than just being fulfilled and content and peaceful, or what I say is satisfied with what is. It's just neat, the mind needs to be trained to just be satisfied with what is, rather than constantly craving, 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 craving. So we'll talk about how to solve this next, But I want to be sure that you guys understand each of these poisons before we actually talk about the remedy for these poisons. So I would like to just pause and see if there's any questions on what is this poison of greed or craving. We have no questions at this time, David, but we do have um, a lot of positive comments, meaningful and uh, sadhu. So I think we're good to carry on. Okay, great. So because the mind is constantly craving because it's constantly wanting it's latching on it has this strong eagerness it has this yearning it has this longing it's it's essentially trying to hold on to everything so tightly and it just it just has this tendency to hold on and crave things relationships jobs incomes material possessions like houses cars clothes shoes computers electronics um fame, uh, uh, notoriety, um, all these different things. The mind just craves. Because the mind is holding on, the way that we remedy this, the antidote to this poison is to train the mind to let go, to just let go and not hold things so tightly. And what we use in order to train that is we use breathing mindfulness meditation. 
It's a meditation that I teach as part of the teachings that I share in the book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Nibbana. In chapter 11, there's breathing mindfulness meditation in there. I also share this in all the classes and retreats that I do. I also share it in these online talks every Wednesday at nine o'clock. We focus on meditation, but breathing mindfulness meditation is how we train the mind over repeated sessions to just let go. Because as thoughts of the past or the future come in, we train the mind to let it go. As ideas and thoughts and perceptions come in the mind, we train it to let it go. And by doing this in meditation over repeated sessions, lots and lots and lots of sessions of training the mind to come to the breath and be in the present moment, when you're in daily life and the mind has this craving, you can identify it as being destructive and unskillful and you can let it go because you've trained the mind enough over repeated sessions of meditation. But if you haven't done that, then the mind's going to still have this craving and it's going to keep craving. So it's going to take many weeks, many months, many years to train the mind to let go. But through doing that in meditation, it will benefit you in daily life that you'll tend to not hold on to things so tightly. The other practice that we employ that Gautama Buddha gave us in order to train the mind to let go is to practice generosity. Generosity is the act of giving, the act of giving our time, our effort, our resources, sharing, essentially sharing. A lot of us were taught to share growing up, but we tend to revert back to kind of our animalistic ways. And that's where these three poisons are coming from, by the way, is all of our rebirths in the animal world. When we finally make it to this human realm, we're still holding on to these three poisons. And one of the primary poisons in the animal world is craving. An animal can't let go of its craving. It's going to constantly want to have sex with lots and lots of partners. It's going to constantly fight for its food. It's not going to always, it's not going to be interested to share its food. But as human beings to become more and more human, we can actually share. And that's what generosity is sharing our time, sharing our effort, sharing our resources like money or clothing, uh, sharing a smile when you see somebody uh, walking down the street, just sharing a smile and not being attached to whether they actually engage or smile back. Just sharing and being generous and being giving because by you being giving of your time, your effort and your resources, you're not going to hold on to things so tightly. Because there are certain things in our life as we're in the unenlightened state that we tend to hold on to. For you, it might be clothes, it might be shoes, it might be money, it might be something else. It might be certain things on your desk or certain things in your room. Uh, it might be food. Um, it's hard to say. Only you know the things in your life that you're holding on to. And if you take a moment and kind of think about this for a bit and you start inventorying your mind, you're going to start identifying things that you're holding on to and you're holding on to them very tightly. Um, it may even be uh, a girlfriend or a boyfriend. It may be um, your time. It may be that you, you be, that essentially what happens with this poison of craving is we become very selfish. We become very self-centered. And because of this, we can't realize this more openness in relationships and engaging with people because we tend to hold on to things very tightly, including our self-image, our ego, um, our identity. We just hold on and constantly hold on. So with breathing mindfulness meditation, you'll train the mind to come into the present moment and focus on the breath. And through the practice of generosity, you will train the mind to let go and practice non-attachment. Okay, so through practicing generosity, it helps you to practice non-attachment. Any questions at this point, Max? I have a question, actually. Uh, I think it relates more to what we're about to move on to, uh, which is the, the aversion side. 
Okay, so, so we'll wait for that. It's okay, I'll ask that now. Yeah. Okay, let's, okay we can do that. Yeah, let's wait we until we discuss on that because then others after. will benefit from your question. Okay, so this first sure. this first poison is utterly important and it's it's a primary aspect of Gautama Buddha's teachings because it causes discontentness of the mind. Through eliminating it, you can eliminate the discontentness. This is essentially the Four Noble Truths. And by eliminate, not only do you eliminate attachment, but uh, in attain more content mind, but you start to realize more openness with people around you. And you eliminate the cycle of rebirth. So you need to eliminate this craving, this poison of craving or greed. Okay. The second poison we call hatred or anger. And there's also other variations of this like ill will. Essentially what hatred or anger is or ill will, Max used the word aversion. Some people use, call it aversion. Essentially what it is is it's the way that we kind of deny or resist or push away things. We push away people, we push away our feelings. We kind of build this wall around us where we're kind of constantly looking for things that are bothersome to us. We become fearful, we become hurt. We have feelings where there's kind of like looking out for enemies around us and we're looking out for conflict. And we become very conflicted with other people and we come, become very conflicted with ourselves. It's when we push others away and we kind of identify this person as being displeasing because things that they say or things that they do or things that uh, we see them do, we disagree with and they're not pleasing to our mind. So therefore we feel like we have to push these people away and by pushing them away, we get to kind of hold on to this sense of peacefulness, this kind of false sense of peacefulness that we're holding on to. This comes from the craving. So what we need to do here with this hatred or anger is realize that it's creating barriers, it's creating walls, it's creating enemies. Even if it's not like a, a real strong hatred or anger or ill will, but even if it's just kind of like a dislike where I, I don't kind of just like this person so much. And when I see them coming, I kind of like kind of twinge inside and kind of look for the exit to kind of like be away from this person. This is because the mind is not comfortable being around others who may be displeasing. It doesn't mean that you need to go around other people, but it means that you need to train the mind to open up and be accepting, being peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, even when you're around situations that are displeasing. Even when people are saying things or doing things, you need to train the mind to still maintain its contentness and peacefulness, even in situations where people are doing things that you maybe don't agree with. Because it's when people disagree with us in the unenlightened state, it's when people disagree with us that we tend to lash out with hatred or anger or frustration or irritation or annoyance because we want the mind wants everything to be pleasing the mind craves this kind of permanent pleasing this permanent satisfaction and even though something around us is displeasing the mind can't be content because it hasn't been trained to do so so it reacts out of anger and hostility and hatred and the lesser versions of that are things like frustration, irritation, maybe hostility or annoyance. And the mind becomes annoyed. And you can even be kind of quietly annoyed, right? Like you may sit there, you may smile, but in the mind, you're just thinking the whole time, oh, this person is just bothering me so much. And we think it's the other person bothering us when in fact it's our own mind expecting that everything around us should be pleasing and that mind becomes angered. The mind may have hatred, but then again, like I'm sharing, there's lesser versions of that 
which are frustration, irritation, annoyance, dislike. And when that happens, we tend to push people away, right? Like how many times have you seen on Facebook where people will post, if you like this or you like this or you like this or you don't like this or you don't like this, then unfriend me. Just unfriend me now, right? If you've been on Facebook for any amount of time, you'll see people who will post that. It's say, okay, if you don't agree with this political perspective, if you don't agree with being vegan or vegetarian, if you support this particular cause, then you're no friend of mine, unfriend me, right? This is the mind pushing people away who have a dis, um, disagreement or have a difference of opinion. The mind can't be content just because somebody else has a different opinion. And we create this wall and this barrier, and now we become unskillful. And that's where the anger, frustration, irritation, that's where we react in very unskillful ways. And it causes us unwholesome results or unwholesome gamma because we can't peacefully exist even in situations where people disagree with us. We react with this anger and frustration. We now create more unwholesome results and we become enraged in some cases or again, lesser versions of that and it creates more and more problems in our life. Rather than just recognizing not everyone's gonna agree with us, not everyone's gonna understand things in the way that we understand them, and it's okay for people to have difference of opinions, but because the mind has that first poison of craving and it's craving permanence, it wants everything to be pleasing, it wants everything to agree with us, it wants everyone to have the same opinion as us, and when they don't, we push them away. And this is why some people call it aversion, because you're kind of pushing or resisting and pushing away. Question, Max? Yeah, so it, in my mind, I, I sort of see aversion and craving as like two sides of the same coin, uh, both, both born out of attachment in some sense or craving kind of is attachment and but it's interesting also how the mind can move to anger very quickly when the craving is not being fulfilled so i just wanted to check with you whether that's a helpful accurate way to, to see it or is it more useful to see craving and aversion almost just two completely separate defilements of the mind you should see them as two separate defilements but these defilements that that's one of the ways we refer to these by the way so we call them the three poisons, the three unwholesome roots is another way people refer to these, the three fires, or some people refer to them as the defilements, kind of like a defilement is kind of like pollution, pollution of the mind, right? <clears throat> so these are the ways that people refer to these. You may see other ways as well. So I tend to use three poisons because then we can talk about the antidote, right? And it really syncs up well with some of Gautama Buddha's other similes that he talked about. So I would view these as three separate poisons, but there is some interplay among them. Because as you said, if the mind's craving and craving and craving and craving, and it becomes displeased, then that's when the anger comes out. That's when the hatred comes out. But they are individual poisons that need to be eradicated. Yep. Yes, yes. The, the mind gets angry when it doesn't get what, it's want, what it wants often. Exactly. Um, and another thing here, yeah, another thing here I think I'd like to highlight that, that you mentioned is, uh, is about how we let go of craving, but also how we cultivate its opposite. And so what's useful here is that there is both the, the abandonment of the poison, but also the cultivation of its opposite. And that's both parts of the antidote there. Right, because remember when I talk about meditation, I usually talk about it in a way that says, during meditation, we're either eliminating certain qualities from the mind or we're cultivating certain qualities in the mind. And here, when we talk about anger and hatred, you'll hear about meditation that we're cultivating certain qualities. Well, not only in meditation are we doing that, 
but in our daily practice, right? This book is developing a life practice. In our life practice, we need to identify these unwholesome qualities of the mind and eliminate those. And we need to identify the wholesome qualities and cultivate those. So the poison of greed or craving, that is an unwholesome quality that we're working to eliminate. The wholesome quality that we're working to cultivate is generosity and non-attachment, right? Essentially, that's what generosity is, is non-attachment. So here with the hatred and anger, the unwholesome qualities that we're eliminating are hatred, anger, hostility, um, frustration, irritation, annoyance, dislike, pushing things away, the hurtful feelings, the always looking out for enemies, um, looking for kind of external conflicts. This is what we're trying to eliminate from the mind. And what we're using to cultivate and kind of replace this poison of, of anger or hatred is loving kindness. Loving kindness is active goodwill for all beings without judgment. So having active goodwill towards all beings, that's the opposite of hatred or anger. And what we do is in meditation, there's a specific meditation that we use in order to cultivate this goodwill. It's called loving kindness meditation. Some people may call it metta meditation, which is just using the Pali word for loving kindness. So in metta meditation or in loving kindness meditation, we're cultivating this active goodwill, starting with ourself and then moving in outward circles increasingly larger and larger circles as I teach it in the teachings. And we do this in meditation over repeated sessions over many days, many weeks, many months, many years. And eventually you get to the point where you've eroded any anger or hatred for your own, for your own self, for people around you in wider and wider circles, eventually reaching all beings so you move it from meditation into daily practice. So just like with craving, there's the meditation practice of breathing mindfulness meditation and then the daily practice of generosity. Well, here with the poison of hatred or anger, there's the meditation practice of loving kindness that you practice on a repeated basis over multiple sessions dedicated training sessions, but then you move that into your daily practice where you're practicing goodwill through your intentions, through your speech, through your actions with all beings, with all beings. And if you've had a lot of anger and hostility in the past and you're just kind of starting out on this path, or even if you've been on it for a while and you've still got a certain amount of anger or hostility, it's kind of easy to have loving kindness for people who are agreeable to you, people who you like, your friends, your colleagues, people who are really close to you that you see as friends. It's really easy to have loving kindness or active goodwill for those people. But what you need to do is you need to move your practice into having active goodwill for all people, even people who are disagreeable to you, even people who have difference of opinions, even people who you at this point maybe dislike. You need to have active goodwill towards them so you can move that dislike, that annoyance, that frustration or irritation, you can move that into uh, active goodwill towards that person, even compassion. Compassion is concern for others' misfortune. So if you can practice loving kindness meditation on a regular basis, not just when you're angry, not just when you're frustrated, but all the time, developing and cultivating this loving kindness in the mind so that then when you're in daily life, you can have active goodwill towards all beings. And this is what's going to work to eliminate this hatred and this anger. Just like with the Eightfold Path, the way to eliminate 
unwholesome gamma is to produce only wholesome gamma through the Eightfold Path, the way to eliminate these poisons is to only produce the antidote. So rather than dwell on the poison, yes, we need to work to eliminate that and identify it when it comes into the mind, but we need to actively cultivate this loving kindness and just fill up the mind and cultivate this loving kindness through meditation, but then practice it in daily life as well. And this is how you will start interacting with people who are even disagreeable to you or who have difference of opinions than you, you can still have active goodwill towards those people and you'll see that your relationships will blossom. And you'll see in difficult situations where when someone maybe used to be angry or frustrated or hostile to you and you used to be angry, frustrated and hostile back, what you should realize with gamma is this isn't going to work. This isn't going to produce anything beneficial. This isn't skillful. It's not going to result in anything positive for you. So even when somebody's hostile and angry back with you practicing active goodwill or loving kindness back, we're not doing it in order to change them because they can only change themselves. But at least in your mind, you are practicing loving kindness and active goodwill towards that person. And you will be able to maintain your peaceful, calm, serene and content mind with joy. And anybody around you can see that you're practicing loving kindness, active goodwill. So you're producing wholesome gamma because people can see, hey, this person's really friendly, really polite and really kind. It's really easy to see that the other person is being hostile, angry, and uh, with hatred or ill will when you're practicing loving kindness. But if that person is being hostile and angry and uh, has ill will towards you and you're doing the same thing back, it's very difficult to see what's going on here because in the eyes of everybody around you, you're both wrong. You're both, uh, you're both hostile. You're both having uh, anger and frustration. So in situations where maybe in the past you might be sarcastic or you might kind of like try to push someone's buttons or you might try to or you might become frustrated or angry, kind of let those feelings go. Don't hold on to them and practice loving kindness. And remember that active goodwill starts with yourself. So early in practice, one way that you might practice loving kindness for yourself when you see someone being hostile and aggressive is you might just choose to walk away. And that's okay. Remember, there's always 10 million right answers in any given situation. So if you're feeling yourself becoming hostile and angry, applying right effort, which is working to eliminate that unwholesome quality and cultivate wholesome quality, might be for you to just walk away from the situation. And that might be the best way for you to not produce any further unwholesome gamma. As you become more and more content, as your mind becomes more stable, as you practice these teachings more and more, including meditation, breathing mindfulness meditation, generosity, loving kindness meditation, you may be able to stay in the situation and kind of skillfully work with this person who's being hostile or uh, is irritated or is angry, you might be able to skillfully work with this person to actually get a beneficial result of what you're trying to achieve. But again, that comes with practice and being more skillful. So if you feel like walking away is a better situation or just being quiet is a better solution, then maybe that's the way you approach it. The Buddhist teachings aren't going to tell you exactly what to do in every situation because there's many different scenarios. There's many different variables. There's many right answers. And you have to find the answer that's right for you. In a situation where maybe there's less attachment or maybe it's just like someone at the DMV or you know, you're ordering food somewhere and they're just being a little bit hostile with you, you may be able to easily kind of let that go and just kind of 
order your food and be kind, be polite, or just give your papers to the transportation authority and get your driver's license or whatever else you need if the people are being hostile towards you. But in another situation where maybe it's a partner or it's your mom or it's uh, somebody that you have a lot of attachment to, when they're maybe being hostile and angry with you, you might feel your hostility and anger coming up. And rather than you trying to maybe skillfully work through that early in practice, it might just be better to walk away or just remain quiet and allow them to vent and just get all their anger out. Because you know whatever they're yelling at you, whatever hostility they have, whatever anger that's coming your way, you know it's impermanent. So you can sometimes just sit there and just let them vent. And then after they calm down, you might be able to politely come in with some calm dialogue and very skillfully work to get a better benefit and a better result. But again, there's always the option to kind of just walk away from the situation too and then let that person sit with those feelings of the hostility and anger and at least you're protecting your own contentedness, you're protecting your own peacefulness that when you step away from the situation, you can just walk away with a smile and you know that you're not allowing yourself to get angry and frustrated. So you have to have a lot of mindfulness. Remember, mindfulness is awareness of mind. So when you start working with your anger, your your hostility, your your hatred, bringing it down to essentially an annoyance and a slight dislike, you'll probably be able to stay in a conversation a lot longer where earlier on and when there's deeper attachment, you might be able you might need to just kind of remove yourself from the situation and move the mind into a different environment in order to maintain your contentedness. Because one of the things that you have to always look for is protecting or guarding your own contentedness. If you allow your mind to get hostile and angry and you start allowing that to come into your speech and your actions, it's going to cause unwholesome results or unwholesome gamma. So if you have developed right mindfulness, which comes with breathing mindfulness meditation, which is part of the Eightfold Path, if you've developed right mindfulness or awareness of mind, then you can very skillfully work with right effort, which is applying skillful speech and skillful action. And some action might be just to say nothing and walk away. You can apply some skillfulness to start extinguishing this hatred and anger that you've been carrying around essentially your whole life that you're hopefully working to resolve at this point. Any questions, Max? Thanks, David. No more questions at this time. Okay. So this is a big one. You know, this one really inhibits us from having this openness with all people around us. And it really inhibits us from having these blossoming relationships, whether it's a romantic relationship with love, whether it's a friendship, whether it's with a parent or a child, a sibling, whether it's with a business contact, uh, someone in the business world, whether it's just going to the hospital or going to the bank or, or going to get certain things taken care of in life, our hostility tends to boil up and it stands in the way of these open relationships where we can just peacefully exist and peacefully, contently, calmly get things accomplished in our life one after another with lots of benefit. So by eliminating this hatred, this anger, this ill will, this resentment, by forgiving people, not holding on to this trauma that, that we feel like has happened to us in the past, we can have these more blossoming relationships. And it doesn't mean that you have to absolutely be in love with every single person you see. You can still disagree with someone's speech or actions or how they interact and choose not to spend time with them and choose not to be close and around them. But 
if someone's eliminating or has eliminated this poison, when that person shows up in their life, they're not going to immediately resist it and push it away. They'll recognize that, okay, this person is doing something that I disagree with. We have a difference of opinion, but I can still smile. I can still be polite. I can still be respectful. I can still be kind, even though this person is of a difference of opinion or disagreeable with me. The Buddha talked about this. He talked about people who are disagreeable versus agreeable. It's very easy to be friendly, polite, respectful to people who are agreeable with you. These are your friends. These are your closest comrades. These are the people you enjoy talking to the most. But it's the disagreeable, the people who have a difference of opinion, the people who we see their speech and their actions, and we don't like it. We don't care for it. And we tend to push them away. And then there's kind of this hostility and this resistance, and we try to create this wall. But someone who's eliminated this poison, whether there's someone agreeable or someone who's disagreeable in their presence, they can be just as polite, just as friendly, just as respectful, practicing right intention, which is harmlessness, practicing right speech, which is the five factors of well-spoken speech, speaking at the right time, speaking truthfully, speaking gently, speaking beneficially, with a mind of loving kindness, blamelessly, without blame, even when there's this person that we disagree with their intention, speech, or actions. We can still practice right speech as well as right action and all the rest of the Eightfold Path. So it's getting beyond that and recognizing that there are going to be people in this world who are disagreeable to us and have difference of opinions and being able to disagree with people politely and respectfully. And in doing that, you will improve your practice. You will improve your ability to interact with all people, with all people, because the mind's not fearful. It's not neurotic. It's not looking out for enemies. And as soon as we hear something displeasing, aha, we react with our hostility and kind of confront hostility with hostility. Well, we know that never works. So if you lower that wall and you get rid of that hatred or anger, that ill will, that hostility, that resentment, then when people who are disagreeable to you show up in your life, you can be okay and you can be content and peaceful because you know this is impermanent, that this person in your life, they're not in your life forever. They're, it's just a temporary thing and you just peacefully exist and be friendly with them even though they may be angry or hostile or frustrated. Or maybe, maybe they're kind and polite, but they just have a difference of opinion than us and we can still be friendly, polite and peaceful with them. So this is what a person who's working to eliminate this, this is how they're going to practice. And they're going to use loving kindness meditation to cultivate that for themselves and all beings. And they're going to move that into daily life through practicing active goodwill or loving kindness in daily life towards all beings. <clears throat> and that's human beings as well as animals as well, right? Animals as well having loving kindness, active goodwill towards all beings, including animals. <coughs> so this third poison, the word that we usually use for this third poison is delusion or ignorance. These are words that are used in our language to talk about this third poison. And I actually disagree with these words. I don't feel that the way that we use these words today is what Gautama Buddha was using when he was describing this poison. And I think you'll understand why the more that I talk about it. I feel that he used the word or phrase unknowing of true reality. Because what this third poison is, is this delusion, this ignorance, or this unknowing of true reality, it is our misunderstanding. It's our wrong views of reality. Essentially, it's our misconception that other people are causing our anger. 
right? Until we understand the Four Noble Truths, until we awaken to the Four Noble Truths and we see it as truth, that we are in fact causing our own anger, our own frustration, our own boredom, our own loneliness, all this discontent mind, this guilt, this fear, this shame, this irritation, this shyness, all of these discontent emotions that we're feeling and we're experiencing, we tend to blame other people for it. And it's not until we awaken to the Four Noble Truths that we realize, wow, we've been causing this ourselves all along and we just didn't know it, right? This is the wrong understanding or the misunderstanding, the wrong views of reality, our misperceptions. This is not realizing that our unwholesome speech is actually causing harm in our life. It's not realizing that this natural law of gamma, of cause and effect or action and result, essentially the result of all of our decisions is gamma. We're unaware of this. We're unknowing of this reality. We have this delusion, or some people say with this ignorance of these natural laws. We have this misperception. We have distorted views of reality. And this is the primary thing that keeps us in the unenlightened state. Because we're unknowing, because we have this misunderstanding, because we have this false sense of reality, because we have these misperceptions and we think everyone else is causing us to be angry, then we're always trying to fix everybody else. And we go around and try to fix everyone else, but yet we still keep getting angry, right? Or we keep being angry or hostile. We keep having this unpolite speech, this disrespectful speech. We, we're still speaking in an ungentle way and we don't understand why people just can't agree with us and see that our way is the right way. And then because they don't agree with us, we become more angry. So we essentially are causing our own discontent mind. And this is our misperception, our misunderstanding, our, our, our um, wrong views of reality. So it's not that we're truly ignorant, right? Because ignorance is like a derogatory term. This is like referring to someone in a derogatory way. So the Buddha didn't really refer to people that way because a fully enlightened person is going to look to have wholesome relationships with all people as best that they can. So a fully enlightened being, a perfectly enlightened Buddha, isn't going to refer to someone as ignorant or stupid because that's derogatory. Uh, an enlightened person isn't going to refer to another person like that. But referring to people as having this poison of unknowing of true reality, this is how I feel the Buddha spoke about this third poison, this unknowing of true reality, that we're misunderstanding. We don't know the Four Noble Truths. We don't know the Eightfold Path. We don't know about the five precepts. We don't know about the natural law of gamma and how our own intentions, speech, and actions are actually causing harm to others. Therefore, it's causing harm to us. We misunderstand this. It's an unknowing of true reality. And the more that we realize these teachings, the more we learn them, the more we practice them, we develop wisdom. That's the antidote to this poison is by learning these teachings and practicing these teachings, you see the truth for yourself. You need teachers and guides to help you to observe the teachings or learn the teachings, but you need to independently observe them on your own through your own practice. And by doing that, you see the truth. You see true reality. If you've walked through this book or you've spent time with me to talk about the Four Noble Truths and you see that you're causing your own discontent mind and you're working to resolve that, that's why you're in these classes, then you're understanding that, yes, I need to work on myself. So you're practicing right view. So you're starting to understand reality. 
and you're gaining the wisdom of the Four Noble Truths. And then when you're studying the Eightfold Path and you're learning those teachings and you're putting them into practice and you're seeing them work for you and you're seeing, wow, this is working. The mind is awakening to this true reality. It's getting more wisdom and it's functioning in the world with more wisdom. It's more wise. And then you're learning about gamma and this natural law of gamma and how it's cause and effect and action and results. And if you're not seeing these things, that's why you need to ask questions through these classes or in the Facebook group or reach out to me individually, having a private conversation so that you can see these truths for yourself. Because remember, none of these teachings are based on belief. This poison is why belief is not going to awaken the mind because you have to see it's true for yourself. You ha in order to get rid of this poison, you have to see the true reality for yourself. You have to see that the Four Noble Truths are indeed truth. You need to see that the Three Universal Truths are indeed truth. You need to see that the Eightfold Path is indeed the way to eliminate the discontent mind. <clears throat> you need to see that the five precepts are indeed significantly going to reduce your unwholesome gamma. You need to see this natural law of gamma so clearly so that you become more wise in order to implement these teachings in daily life. And it's through acquiring this wisdom through your own independent practice, seeing the truth, not with belief, because belief isn't going to liberate the mind. <clears throat> but by applying these teachings in real life and everyday life, the mind is going to start seeing true reality. It's going to become more wise. And because of that, it's going to function in the world differently than it did prior to learning about these teachings. So it's actually the wisdom that you acquire through learning and practicing these teachings that eliminates this poison. And without that, you would never be able to eliminate the other two, right? So while the other two poisons are what's keeping you rooted in the unenlightened state without working on this third poison, you would never even be aware that those other two poisons are affecting the mind. It's not until you learn the Buddhist teachings that you even understand that craving is a problem. It's not until you understand the Buddhist teachings that you realize that you're causing your own discontentness. It's not until you learn the Eightfold Path that you actually have a foundation for your life practice, to practice on a daily basis. So without learning and practicing the teachings on a regular basis through the book, through podcasts, through these classes, through uh, meditation, through all the things you're doing to practice the teachings, the YouTube channel, the Facebook group, all the things you're doing to learn the teachings and implement them in daily life, that's working to build your wisdom, which ultimately liberates the mind. And by you seeing this as truth in your own independent practice, you further gain more and more and more wisdom. You apply these teachings more and more. You start working to eliminate the hatred and anger. You start working to eliminate this greed or craving. You start implementing more and more of these teachings and the mind is liberated through wisdom. I mentioned this all the way through the book countless times about liberating the mind through wisdom. Essentially what that is, is continuing to learn and practice the teachings so that you can see their truth. And in doing so, you'll work to eliminate this, this poison of delusion or ignorance or unknowing of true reality, which as you're doing that, it opens up the mind to eliminate all these other poisons that you're experiencing. So questions? So David, yeah, is there anything unwholesome or any unwholesome karma that can be created that does not ultimately originate from one of these three poisons? No. In fact, <clears throat> the Buddha said that all karma is generated th from these three poisons. We're going to be covering Gamma, I think, next week, if I remember correctly. Chapter 9 is Gamma. So that's why these three poisons are Chapter 8, and right after it is Chapter 9, which is Gamma. 
because this is the three unwholesome roots, right? I call it the three poisons, but in the book I also mention it as the three unwholesome roots because these are the roots that are causing all the unskillful behavior, all the unskillful speech, all the unskillful actions, all the things that are inhibiting you from an enlightened mind are coming from these three poisons. So in order to get rid of this weed or in order to get rid of this horrible, ugly tree that has been growing and replant a new beautiful plant, you've got to go all the way to the root. You can't just clip off the branches and just kind of be polite every now and then. You can't just chop off the top of the tree because it's going to grow again. You have to utterly destroy the entire tree all the way down to the root, all the way down to the unwholesome root. And these three poisons are the roots of all unwholesome gamma. So all unskillful speech, all unskillful actions, everything unwholesome, unwholesome results are coming from these three poisons. And it's only when you eradicate these and eliminate these that the mind is going to attain enlightenment. And we talked about the 10 fetters in chapter three. Well, the 10 fetters are essentially several, a layer deeper than the three poisons. So there's the three poisons, which is kind of like a high level way of understanding the mind. But if you look at the 10 fetters, each of those 10 fetters map into one of these three poisons. So once you get up and running on the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the Five Precepts, you understand the three poisons, you're practicing these teachings with meditation, you're getting closer and closer to enlightenment, then you start focusing on the 10 fetters, which are essentially helping you to more deeply, more finely, and in a much more detailed fashion, root out these three poisons, which gets down to the root of these three poisons. Great. Thanks for that, David. No more questions. Okay. So let's move to the next um, part, which is essentially just something I put together for you to see, which is the antidote to all of these three poisons. And it's something that I've already discussed, but I wanted to kind of put it on a separate slide so that you guys can see it because there's a certain amount of learning that's done through hearing me talk, but also you reading it and seeing it in writing oftentimes helps you to, to learn as well. So here you see the antidote to these poisons or the solution, the way to eliminate these three poisons with greed and craving, which is the same thing. This tendency for the mind to hold on and latch on and not let go. Breathing mindfulness meditation, which is the foundation of your meditation practice, is training to let go of the thoughts so that every time there's a thought that comes in, you let it go. The Buddha used the word, cut off your thoughts, right? This is essentially cutting off the thought at the root. You'll still have thoughts in daily life, but what you're doing in meditation is you're training the mind to let go. So you're going to have a thought come in and you just let it go. You have another thought come in, you let it go. You have another thought come in and you let it go. And having done this over multiple sessions, multiple weeks, multiple months of just every time something comes into the mind, you let it go and bring it back to the breath. You train the mind over and over so that when you're in daily life and that person shows up, that said something displeasing to you six months ago and disagreed with your opinion in your business meeting, you can let it go. You can just let it go because you've trained the mind so well in meditation that you're just comfortable just letting it go and you can smile and be pleasant in their presence. And the other practice here is the daily practice of generosity because generosity is the outward giving or sharing of your time, your effort, your resources, things of this nature, uh, your clothing, your food, your, your money, your um, anything, right? Just sharing. 
essentially one of the things that the Buddha talked about in his teachings is he said, once you understand gamma, once you understand that every being that you encountering today is at some point has been your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, or some other relative, because of our countless rebirths, we've all been family at one time or another in some previous birth. Once you understand these teachings to that level of detail with gamma, with our previous rebirths, with, when you understand how the mind's holding on, he said that it's very difficult to sit down and eat a meal without sharing it with somebody else. It's very difficult for you to do that. So once you understand how much this holding on and this craving and this grasping and holding things so tightly, once you understand how, many, how much problem that's causing you in your daily life, then you're almost willing to kind of just let go of pretty much anything. But this is where the teachings of the middle path come in, right? Because if you just emptied your bank account and gave away everything to everybody that you saw, then you wouldn't have what you need to sustain your life. But also if you held on to everything and you just hold everything so tightly, then the mind has craving and it's not going to let go. So this is where you have to find the middle path is where is that middle, right? So practicing generosity and you'll be able to do that more and more in your, in your practice. And then with this poison of hatred or anger, using loving kindness meditation, on Wednesday, essentially three days from now, I'll be teaching loving kindness meditation again. I've been kind of rotating on Wednesday, breathing mindfulness meditation, loving kindness meditation, and chanting, because these are the two meditations that every person needs in order to attain enlightenment, breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation. There's tons of other meditations out there, but these are the two primary that you need in order to attain enlightenment because these are the poisons that are keeping you in the unenlightened state. So you have the book, you have podcasts, you have YouTube videos, you have these sessions each Wednesday to come to and learn these two types of meditation, the breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation to cultivate active goodwill in the mind towards yourself and all beings. And after you've done that enough with me and you've learned enough and you've asked, asked a lot of questions, you'll have developed a regular practice of these two meditations in your daily life so that then in addition to the meditation, you're practicing loving kindness in daily life. Because you can't just meditate your way to enlightenment. You can't just do breathing mindfulness meditation and loving mindfulness meditation because everything's going to feel great while you're sitting, laying, standing, or walking. You're going to feel really great in the mind, but you have to bring that with you in daily life. And that's where you're practicing generosity and loving kindness in daily life. So you need to bring it with you. We cultivate it, loving kindness in meditation, but then we bring it with us in daily life and practice it around all beings. In meditation, we practice letting go of the thoughts, letting go of the past, of the future with breathing mindfulness meditation. And then in daily life, we practice generosity and sharing with things. Even you've got a bag of chips, just offering somebody a bag of chips or, or, or one of your chips in the bag, right? You don't even have to offer the whole bag, but just kind of making a habit of just offering somebody a chip. Um, and if they take two or three chips, being okay with that, not having an expectation that they only take one, right? Just here, would you like a chip? And just sharing with people. Um, so you need to practice these. And then this third poison of delusion or ignorance or unknowing of true reality, continually having a practice where you're working to learn and practice the teachings whether that's sitting with the book regularly and learning, reading the book regularly, whether that's coming to these classes, whether it's listening to the podcast, whether it's watching the YouTube videos, whether it's taking the quizzes, whether it's asking questions uh, in the Facebook group or during class, whether it's coming to live classes here in Chiang Mai or retreats, essentially building 
a regular kind of trickle of this gradual learning where you can gradually learn the teachings, apply them in your life, and gain more and more wisdom. Because it's that wisdom that's going to liberate the mind to become enlightened. Because one of the things that Buddha used to do, rather than just always refer to people as enlightened, he used to talk to people as wise. He would say, it is wise to do this. Or a wise person would do this. What he's saying is an enlightened person will do this. So he didn't always say an enlightened person will do this, an enlightened person will do that. But throughout his teachings, whenever you see him talk about a wise person, what he's talking about is an enlightened person. So the way that you become wise is you gain wisdom. And because these teachings aren't based on belief, you're learning with guidance and you implement them in your daily life and you see the truth for yourself, then you know you can't be misled because if something that's being shared with you, if you implement it and it's working, then you know the truth and you can see the truth for yourself. But if you implement it and it's like, hey, this teaching doesn't make sense, it doesn't connect and you've asked a lot of questions and you can't get clarification on it, then you know that that teaching is in truth. So if you have an active practice of learning the teachings and applying the teachings where things aren't working, you should be able to ask questions and get clarification and keep working on that over and over and over until you see that it's truth. And if you don't see that it's truth, then you can discard it. But I'm pretty sure that there's nothing that I'm going to share with you that you would discard because I know everything that I'm teaching is truth because I've, like I said in our last class, is everything that I'm teaching you is from the Buddhist teaching, the source of his teachings in the Pali text. I've practiced it myself to see that it works. So I have my own practice, my own experience that it works. I've taught it to other people and it works for them and I see it working for them, liberating their mind. And when I talk to Thai people and, and monks or Bikinese within this tradition, they confirm that what I'm teaching is, is the same things that they've learned and what they teach or that they've learned from monks that they consider to be enlightened. So I've confirmed everything that I share with you in these four different ways. So if there's something I share with you that for some reason it's not quite working or it's not quite setting right, that's where you have the opportunity to ask questions and clarification through the Facebook group, through these classes, through in-person classes, through one-on-one talks, if you'd like to talk one-on-one, because you need to receive guidance, but then because you don't believe anything that I say, you need to implement it in practice and see the truth for yourself. And by seeing that truth, then you know it's true and you have more wisdom. It's just like Santa Claus, right, Max? Once you, That's right, right. once you, at one time you believe that Santa Claus existed, but then you got the wisdom to know that he doesn't exist. And now nobody could ever convince you that Santa Claus ever exists again. So the same thing is I share these teachings with you. You don't believe them. You put them in practice for yourself. You see the truth and now you have the wisdom and no one could ever convince you again once you have the wisdom, no one could ever convince you again that other people are causing you to be angry. If you see the truth of the Four Noble Truths, if you've awakened your mind to the point that you understand that you're causing your own discontent mind and you can eliminate it and you eliminate it through the Eightfold Path, if you see that utterly clear, then you have that wisdom and no one could ever convince you otherwise. This is where the Buddha described an enlightened mind as being unshakable. Because once you gain the wisdom of these teachings and you see it to be true for yourself, the mind becomes unshakable. Just like with Santa Claus. I could never convince you that Santa Claus exists. I don't care how much I talk about Santa Claus. I don't care how many Santa Clauses I show you in the mall. I don't care how many presents I put under my tree, how many footprints in the snow that I show you, you'll never, ever, ever believe that Santa Claus ever exists.
because you know the truth for yourself and you have that wisdom. But now you need to do that with all of these teachings so that you have the wisdom to eliminate this delusion, this ignorance, this unknowing of true reality, eliminating this poison so that the mind becomes unshakable and you know the truth for yourself. You don't believe me. You don't believe the book. You don't believe any teacher. You want to see the truth for yourself. Okay, you'll listen. You'll receive guidance. You'll take in the teachings, but you need to see it for yourself as truth. That's how you gain wisdom. That's how you get an unshakable mind. Even when I was studying the Buddha's teachings, which I felt are a very reliable source with all the source texts that I have, even though I knew that it was a reliable source, even though I felt like these were absolutely the words of Gautama Buddha, I didn't believe any of it. I put it into practice and saw that it worked for myself. And that's how the mind becomes unshakable to know the truth. Okay. So you need to work to eliminate these three poisons. These are greed, hatred, and delusion, or craving, anger, and ignorance, or unknowing of true reality. And through eliminating these three poisons, realizing non-self, eliminating the ego, you will attain enlightenment. And in order to do that, you need to dive deeper into the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the Five Precepts, the Three Poisons. You need to understand the Ten Fetters and a lot of other things along the way. But as you're doing that, you're gaining more and more wisdom and the mind will awaken slowly, slowly, slowly and gradually. This is why if somebody ever tells you that the Buddha attained enlightenment in an instant, you know, no way. He had realizations over the course of his entire life, but directly for those six years that he dedicated time and effort to, he had realization after realization after realization that his mind became more and more wise and it gradually awakened to these teachings. Just like you gradually wake up in the morning when you're um, waking up in the morning from a, a deep sleep, your mind's going to gradually awaken to these teachings more and more. Okay. Any questions? Yes, yeah, so we have a question from Bill. So Bill asks, how does one resolve the problem that comes up when during this time of the pandemic, seeing the suffering of friends that aren't able to work and are un unable to practice generosity? This causes me great sadness and worry for others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is there's a couple of things there in your question, Bill, you know, with them not being able to practice generosity, <coughs> that's just where they are right now. Right. Because that's the middle way. We have to find the middle. And remember, when we talked about the middle way, I talked about how it's always changing. Right. It's kind of like ebbing and flowing. So what the middle is today might not be what the middle is tomorrow. So maybe a month or two ago where they had a lot of wealth, they had a job, they had a consistent income. Maybe they could be more generous with their time, their effort and their money. And they were able to practice in a certain way. And they found the middle at that particular time where now because of impermanence, everything's changed. And now they have to find the middle again. Right. And this is where people can have a lot of problems, because if the mind is holding on and craving what they had in the past, and they keep practicing the way that things were in the past and just giving, 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 giving or um, kind of expecting that the salary is going to come, then they can get into a lot of debt. So this is where the mind has to recognize that it's in this period of change and they need to kind of maybe pull back and find the new middle where their middle a couple of months ago in terms of generosity was different than where they are now. So that's one part in terms of practicing generosity. You always got to find the middle and realize that that's going to always be changing because of impermanence. The other part of your question about maybe the mind being sad or frustrated or discontent or irritated about um, seeing your friends 
not have an income or suffer because of the current condition of the economy and the pandemic that's going throughout the world. This is the mind, you know, expecting that our friends are going to always be in a, a good situation and wanting to see them be in a pleasurable situation. This is the mind not being comfortable with seeing dis displeasing things and the mind not realizing that this is just part of gamma. This is part of our decisions. That's why when this pandemic hit, the first thing that I kind of shared with everybody is the cause. Why is this pandemic here? Well, we caused it. We caused it because we chose to have markets that sell animals and living beings and we choose to eat these living beings and we came in close contact with these animals and the virus came into the human world. So this is our gamma. Everything that we're experiencing with the economy, with the quarantine, with everything that we're, in, we're experiencing, it's our gamma because we have individual gamma, but then we have a collective society gamma as well. So we can only improve our own gamma as an individual. But essentially what your friends are experiencing and not being out of work and not maybe being able to provide for themselves as they could in the past, this is their gamma. Um, it doesn't mean that they were directly related to the transmission of the flu or the coronavirus from the animal to the human. They weren't the first person that that happened to but as a collective society, we have been having business and living beings. We have been eating meat and we have been killing living beings. And this is our collective gamma that we're now experiencing as part of this. So you have to get the mind comfortable with seeing gamma play out and realizing that the world is not going to be a perfectly peaceful, calm, serene, content, joyous place that there's going to be problems in the world. And there's only so much that you can do to resolve that. All you can really do is focus on your own practice and share these teachings if you like with other people and have them learn because the more people that learn these teachings, the more that this spreads throughout the world the more that we can all clean up our collective gamma, our individual gamma, and our collective gamma. So this is just your mind being discontent because it's holding on and it's wanting to see your friends be in the same situation as they were in the past. But this is a new situation. It's a new moment in time. It's new situation. It's a new variables, new environment. And they don't have as much money. They don't have as much resources. They don't have the same things accessible to them as they did in the past. And that's just impermanence. And the mind has to get comfortable with that. Thanks, David. I think when a lot of people think of generosity, we maybe think that we have to give money or at least some mm -hmm. kind of kind of resource. Yeah, something that you mentioned earlier actually is that it's not at all the case we can give anything we can give our energy our time goodwill a yeah, smile exactly opportunity for someone to talk there's all manner of ways we can give our generosity exactly like max is practicing generosity here right like every week he joins and he does this moderation he doesn't have to do this he's not getting compensation for it he's not getting paid for it <coughs> he's sharing his time and his effort to create a better learning environment for for all of you guys and then i'm practicing generosity by sharing my teachings over many 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 months and years and you know putting together all these uh, talks and all these resource excuse me all these resources books and podcasts and youtube videos all the posts that i do i probably spend a good 80 plus hours a week dedicated to sharing these teachings with everybody, sharing these teachings with you. And that's generosity. At one time in my life, I didn't have much time 
because I was spending a lot of time making money and I was a business person. And at that time I had a lot of money, so I used to share a lot of money with people, uh, with the temples, with my employees, with friends, family, with other people. I used to share a lot of money, but now I don't have much money. I have hardly any money, but what I have is I have time. So I share my time and my effort, and I share that in as large a quantity as I can, but then I have to find the middle and I have to spend time for myself. I, have, I need to spend time with my son, you know, and other other efforts that I have. So, yeah, there's lots of ways to practice generosity. But I was thinking in, in Bill's question, you know, if, if people are from what I saw, I know Bill is from America. From what I saw, there's a lot of Americans that are even having trouble just finding food because the, the grocery stores are out of stock. Right. And let's talk about that and use that as an example. Here in Thailand, our grocery stores aren't out of stock. You go to the markets, you go to the grocery stores, they're full. They're just as full as they always are because people didn't go out and hoard everything and craving everything and selfishly stock up their home with food because they thought the whole world was coming to an end and they're craving and being selfish. They didn't do that. But because of America and just because people aren't practicing these teachings, they're not aware of them. And I think a lot of people are looking at this pandemic like a snowstorm that a lot of people went out and kind of cleared the shelves from what I hear. I don't know, cleared the shelves of grocery stores. And now people are stocked up and they're kind of very worried and fearful if they're actually going to have food at a certain time because everybody's hoarded. Hoarding is just another way to say craving and greed, right? They've kind of hoarded this and felt like if I just have 18,000 rolls of toilet paper, the mind will be content. The mind will be peaceful. I will be happy if I have 18,000 rolls of toilet paper or if I have 500 bottles of, of um, hand sanitizer, I will be happy. I will be content. But what they realize is 500 is not enough. They want more. They want more. They want more. Right. This is the craving. So this whole pandemic that we're experiencing, it's a great opportunity to talk about the teachings because we see it being played out in many different places. But here in Thailand, where people have been practicing these teachings for centuries, multiple centuries, they didn't go out and hoard food. There was a few places that did a little bit of that, but not really, not much. Um, when I go to the market, it's just as full as as normal, if not more full, uh, that we can actually go out and buy lots of groceries, you know, whenever we want. Every two or three days we go out and buy fresh food. So these type of situations where the mind becomes discontent, we might see these poisons come out stronger and stronger, right? Like when everybody's going to work and it's just a normal life and everything's going fine and everything's just happening, everything just kind of accepts the, what we call the normal, right? But then when everything gets shaken up, i.e. impermanence comes in and everything gets shaken up, the greed and craving goes up really high. The anger and hatred goes up really high because of the, ang because of the delusion and ignorance is up really high. So this is where people might go out to the grocery store and they're craving and craving and craving things and they really want toilet paper and they really want um, hand sanitizer. And then when it's not there, they become angry and they become hateful towards the other people. Right. And these poisons just keep rising up more and more and more. So the more impermanence that the mind experiences, these three poisons just start increasing more and more and more. Or I shouldn't say they start increasing. We start seeing the symptoms of these three poisons come out more and more because impermanence is affecting the world so greatly. And that's what we're seeing right now in the world with some people. We're seeing these three poisons, uh, the symptoms of them. But then also people who are practicing these teachings more, not just Thai people, but even in America, you see some people um, throughout the world who are being more kind, more peaceful, more friendly, more generous. They're sharing their time. Um, I've seen celebrities that are buying fabric and cutting up fabric and sewing face masks for the public or for healthcare workers, right? So 
you'll see people who are really deep into the darkness and in the unenlightened state with these three poisons drastically affecting the mind. When something heavy like a pandemic hits, they're going to have symptoms of those three poisons where people who are practicing the opposite, which is the generosity, the loving kindness and wisdom, you're going to see people during big pandemics and big situations like this start practicing those teachings more because that's what's more natural for them. So you'll see during problematic times that people will practice whatever is in the mind. That's what's what will come out. Thanks, David. So we talked there also about what what we give as generosity, but also what about where we give it? Are there are there better ways to give our give our resources, our time? Are there certain recipients that are more meritorious to, to give to? How should we navigate that? That's where discernment comes in, right? Like your own personal decisions. <clears throat> Everybody has to decide where they spend their time, their effort, their resources, where do they share? Not only where they share, but when they can share, you know, back to Bill's question. Because we may be in a position where we can share very generously at one time in our life. And then other times we may have to move that from like where I used to share money a lot. I now share my time and my effort. So everybody has to decide for themselves, you know, like where and, and how to share. But there's lots of different levels of sharing, right? Like if I'm somewhere and I open up a, a bag of chips or something and there's other people around, I'm going to offer it to people and I'm going to share it with them, even just a, a simple chip, just to remind myself not to hold on. Um, that's one level of generosity. And then there's, you know, okay, digging into our our resources, our, our reserves, our, our money, our 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 food, our, our supplies, and sharing those with people. Uh, so there's different levels of sharing, and there's different um, types of places where we can share, and that's where you have to decide for yourself where is the right place to share and, and when would be a good time in terms of what resources you have available. And this is actually interesting because I was actually planning to ask you guys for your support on this at the end of this talk is I'm actually working on something now I'm looking to turn this written book into an audio book and I would like to ask for your support if you guys would be willing to provide donations or some type of help in order to help me turn this written book into an audio book because I would like to share it with you guys in audio and a lot of people have asked for that. And if you're able to share, I have different ways that you can do that through Patreon or through PayPal as a way for you to practice generosity and help me to continue to support you guys. Because what I do is I spend my time, you know, about 80 hours plus per week, and I also spend my money to not my money but the money that i acquire through other means i spend it on like the zoom membership you know this is uh, about almost five thousand baht a year for, for me um, i spend uh, uh, money for the broadcast to actually broadcast this out to facebook i actually purchased a, a service to be able to do that i purchase um all different types of resources to be able to offer these teachings to you and spend my time. So I thought that maybe this might be a good time to seek your support to actually uh, support me to continue to support you. Thanks, David. So I, I for one, certainly very grateful for everything you've done, all the generosity you've given. I've benefited hugely from your guidance. And, and also as a, a Patreon patron, I, I'm seeing you put those donations to very good use. So I'm also very keen to see this audio book come into fruition and I'll gladly donate. So um, I think that's going to be a really, you know, I think it's a really beneficial project that will help a lot of people. So I, I want to donate £150 towards that. Um, Thank to, you. To, Thank to you, Max. That recorded. 
it's I, mean, I wish I could wish I could give more really but um like I say I think that's from my perspective a very very wholesome use of funds because I know that it will go towards something very helpful yeah for me what I've done is you know at one time in my life I made uh, about um about eighty thousand hundred thousand u s dollars a month at one time in my life, and I was living at a certain uh, level with that income and over the years, I've slowly transitioned that where now <clears throat> I live on about three or four hundred dollars a month. The way that I've set up my life is very simple living, very basic, just food and clothes and water um, I don't really need medical stuff but um, just very simple life, three or four hundred dollars a month is all it takes to support me. And that allows me to spend the amount of time that I do to devote to supporting you guys with these teachings. Where if before, when I was in the business world and living that certain life, I would have never been able to spend the amount of time that I spend now. So in now, because I've transitioned my life to the way it is, I can live very uh very meagerly very small amount of money so any donations that are provided to me they can really be put to good use here in thailand for example this studio that i'm working with to uh, or that i would like to work with in order to do this audiobook the service there is is very minimal compared to what i would need to pay if i was living in america so i need to pay about 800 to a thousand US dollars to turn this into an audiobook. And if I was in America, it would be about 3,000, 4,000 US dollars to do that. So just by physically being here in Thailand with the cost of living being so low, by me adjusting my, my way of living, by having access to people who can do things for me at very little cost, something like 150 pounds max, that goes a really long way to helping me to uh, support you guys and offer these teachings the way that I do. So I do set up or I, do, I have set up Patreon and PayPal for you guys to be able to uh, share if you would like and be generous to share even just $5 a month or $10 a month to be able to support these type of efforts and all the donations that you give me I use them directly to help more people spread the teachings either through advertising for classes or printing materials or uh, doing the audiobooks or doing all the different things that I, I do. I use these resources and these donations to help me to help you guys. So that basically it's like it's gamma. It's coming right back to you. So by you donating to me, I actually put it right back into supporting you guys and developing more resources so this is gamma that it, it just comes right back to you so thank you max and anyone else who decides to contribute to these different uh through patreon or through paypal i appreciate your your donations thanks david yes mm -hmm. i really think this audio book will be a great thing to have and also another way that people can find the teachings that can discover you uh, searching for books about Buddha's teachings, for example, audio is a way that a lot of people like to consume content these days. So I think it's a really viable uh, fruit, um, awesome project to be involved in. Yeah. And while we're talking about gamma as it relates to generosity and giving, I would like to talk about that for a second, because, <clears throat> you know, we talk about by giving, you know, it, it comes back to us. Right. And I kind of gave you one example of that here. But let's just say that I'm not involved. Let's just say that Let's say you donate your time to a uh, an animal shelter or you donate some food to an orphanage or you donate some clothes to something else. Right. So sometimes we have a hard time seeing how does that actually benefit us? Well, if you understand generosity and that that by practicing that it actually reduces your mind's craving, it reduces your holding on it reduces this tendency of the mind to hold on so tightly by you giving your time, effort, resources, it actually benefits you because you're training the mind to not hold on so tightly. So do you see that gamma, how that comes back to you? 
right? Like in my situation, if you donate money to me, it's coming right back to you in teachings, you know, like you can kind of see that very clearly. But if you gave clothes to an orphanage, you might not see how that comes back to you. But the way it comes back to you is through you practicing generosity, it's removing and helping you to eliminate this craving, this natural tendency for the mind to hold on. So that's the benefit in the way that it's benefiting you. But when you actually give, you should be giving without the expectation of anything in return. Because if you're giving with an expectation of something in return, then you've kind of negated the whole intention of actually giving in the first place. I remember one time, probably a good 10 years ago, I was at a temple in America and a Thai lady comes up to me with her, <clears throat> with her American husband and says, she says, I've seen you here and I know you're practicing the Buddhist teachings. I want you to explain something to my husband. I just can't explain it to him. And I was like, sure, I'll help you. What is it? And I go and talk to her husband and her husband says, you know, I've given money to the temple and I understand this gamma that if I give money, I should be getting something in return. But I've given two thousand five hundred dollars over the last however many years and I haven't seen anything come back to me at all. Right. So he's only in this situation. He was only giving because he was expecting something in return. And his wife just couldn't explain to him how by him giving it was actually helping the monks, helping the temple, helping them to host him there every week for training and learning and teaching. And by him giving, it was actually helping him to reduce his craving, reduce his mind's tendency to hold on. But it was also helping him to learn the teachings. So this is something that a lot of people have a hard time to see that we need to be generous without any expectation of anything in return. But there is something there, even if the return is just training the mind to not hold on and not cling so tightly. So we have questions, David, both in the class and on Facebook asking about how to donate. So uh, both PayPal and Patreon have been mentioned. What's the, the best way? Is there a best way or are either just as good? Um, both are just as good. It really depends on you. Maybe, Max, you could copy and paste the Patreon and PayPal links in to the different areas because yeah. um, I like Patreon really a lot because uh, people like Carol and Max and Julie and um, uh, there's other people in there as well that uh, Bill has set this up where it's just kind of like $10, $15. Uh, some people put 25 or more. Just it's set up on an auto pay where every month it just subtracts that out and transfers it into to my account to be able to use for these different efforts that I use the, the donations for. So if you're in a situation where you can donate five, ten dollars, twenty dollars, whatever works for you at this time, uh, and you can always adjust it as you need to, it'll just on a monthly cycle, it'll just happen automatically without you having to think about it. And then I actually can do some planning with that, too. If I can see that there's a certain amount coming in every month, then I can kind of know like next month, OK, I'm planning to do this new effort and I would like to apply these donations to that effort. I can do a little bit of planning for it. But if that's not something that you're able to do on a regular basis and pa Patreon doesn't work for you, there's PayPal that you can just do kind of ad hoc. Like it's just you can just do a one time payment or one time donation through PayPal. So if Patreon works for you, that really works nice for me because I can do some planning and I can um, look ahead and kind of plan for these different efforts to support you guys with audiobooks and other resources to continue your learning. So it looks like Max is putting that into the comments there for you guys. Yeah, just doing that, just in the Patreon again. And also there's a PayPal link. I'm just digging that out as well. So that'll be in the comments soon. Were there other questions besides that, Max? No more questions, David. Okay. So in working with these three poisons, what I suggest for you is you've got to work on that third poison. 
that's the primary thing. Without that, you never can even work on the others. So that third poison of delusion, ignorance, unknowing of true reality, you need to have a regular practice, whether it's once a week, twice a week, three times a week, whatever it is, sitting down with the book, sitting down with a podcast, with a YouTube video, coming to these classes, whatever it is for you, whatever works for you, and only you know what that is. Maybe it's all those things, right? The quizzes, all these different resources that I've made available for you guys. You've got to have a regular practice of taking in the teachings, gradually taking those in, applying them in your daily life, and seeing the truth for yourself and getting wisdom, right? So you've got to work on that. And you've got to make sure you have something regular set up for that. And I've set up all these different means for you guys to be able to do that, right? Facebook, <clears throat> YouTube, podcast, quizzes, in-person classes, online classes, uh, audiobooks coming hopefully soon in a few months once I get enough resources for that. All these different mechanisms and ways that I'm kind of making available for you to bring in the teachings, right? So you've got to work on that third poison, and make sure you've got something standard set up on a regular repeated basis <clears throat> to take in the teachings and get help as you need asking questions either one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting like this then as you're learning the teachings you should be practicing breathing mindfulness meditation with generosity and you should be practicing loving kindness meditation with loving kindness in daily life. So you have this regular practice of slowly eroding and chipping away at these three poisons. And the more that you do that, the more you're going to see that the quality of the mind is going to improve, the condition of the mind is going to improve, things are that once made you angry and made you really frustrated are going to kind of go down to being kind of irritated to annoyed to oh, i kind of didn't like that too much to hmm i feel completely fine like that didn't bother the mind at all and you're going to see this natural progression of the mind going from these real strong emotions strong feelings that are generated out of these three poisons down to less and less and less and less as you're extinguishing these three poisons and in order to do that, you need to, to, in order to extinguish these three poisons, you need to ramp up on the teachings of the Buddha. The Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the Five Precepts, the Ten Fetters, all of these different teachings. So most of you guys are starting to come regularly to these teaching, to these classes now. And I see you guys participating in the online group as well. So I have a good feeling that you guys are, are working on these pretty readily, which is which is great. So continue to work on that poison of delusion, ignorance, or unknowing of true reality through continually looking at building more and more wisdom with these teachings through your own practice. I'm here as a guide. I'm here as a teacher. I'm here to share the teachings with you. But the more you practice them, the more you'll see the truth for yourself. Don't believe anything I say. Don't ever believe me. Anything I say, put it into practice and see that it works. So that's how you're going to build wisdom. And then part of that is breathing mindfulness meditation daily. Hopefully you can get once a day, should be at least once a day, ramp up to that. And then once that starts doing well for you, start expanding the time more and more, start expanding the frequency, maybe go from once a day to twice a day if you can. Now, if you're inside a lot, maybe you can even go to three times a day. And then when you go back to work, maybe you have to ramp it back down to, to maybe twice a day. So working to ramp up your breathing mindfulness meditation, ramping up your loving kindness meditation. Then in your daily life, practicing generosity, even with a simple, would you like a potato chip, right? Or would you like an M&M? Would you like a bite of this chocolate bar? Just something as simple as that all the way up to being giving of your time, your effort, and your resources. And then practicing loving kindness, active goodwill towards all beings, all beings, even people 
and especially people that have hurt you in the past, right? Even if you never see those people ever again in your life or you have no interest in seeing those people ever in your life, at least eliminate the resentment that you carry in the mind or eliminate the ill will or the hatred or the frustration or annoyance that's in the mind that you might hold for various people from the past. Eliminate that. Or if there are certain groups of people that you don't like, like say, say you happen to be um, someone who eats meat and you choose to eat meat and that's your life. But all these vegan and vegetarian people just bother you with all their different requests of trying to get people to be vegetarian all the time. Just let that go and have loving kindness and goodwill towards all those people and recognize that they're just craving. They're just craving for everyone to follow what they follow. And maybe you choose to be vegetarian or vegan at some point in your life, which I think is wise, but maybe that's not right now. That's not where you are right now. So just recognize that that's their craving that they're trying to push everybody to and don't hate them. Don't be frustrated at them. Just have concern for their misfortune and just practice goodwill towards all beings. So the more that you do this, the more that you're going to see that your mind's going to continually improve, the condition of your mind's going to improve, and the mind's going to gradually awaken to this more enlightened mind. So with that, I would just like to say thank you all for joining me today. Thank you all for choosing to learn and practice these teachings of Gautama Buddha. Thank you for deciding that this is something that's important for your life. Because by you and me learning and practicing these teachings, it's improving our life, but it's improving the life of the people around us, which means it's improving the life of all of humanity. And the more and more people that are learning and practicing these teachings, then the world just gets better and better and better. So I want to thank you for choosing to learn and practice the teachings of Gautama Buddha. And I'll see you on Wednesday at 9 o'clock for loving kindness meditation. And if for some reason you can't meet then, on next Sunday at 9 o'clock Thai time, we're going to be talking about the natural law of gamma, understanding that in detail and understanding how it affects you. So I'll see you guys either online or in a future class. And until then, be well. Sawadikap, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Sawadikap. Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.